just a second. So welcome to day three of the lightning talks. I think we have 11 of them set up. We need to get done on time. The boat will be out front. They're going to be cranky if I run over, so we're going to get moving now. Hello, everyone. Uh, so about me, my name is Fulvio Scapin. I'm a sysadmin and occasional developer from Italy. And as every sysadmin, I've got problems and they have names. They are users. So, my problem, I manage email systems at work and users like, for some reason, to give their credentials away. To scammers, we then use those credentials to send, I don't know, spam, phishing, in fact, emails through the system we manage, and that is not good. So, we need to spot them, stop them, and possibly cleaning the system as soon as possible. Unfortunately, to do so, one should analyze information spread across many log files from many multiple sources or machines over time and detect anomalous behavior. And that's difficult because to do manually, especially in real time. So one would need ideally to correlate different information together using some custom heuristics and stitching together that data from many sources and then track it over time. But sometimes that even that is not enough. You have to actually enrich it with some sort of additional information from outside. For instance, geolocalizing the source IP addresses. So we get to a missing piece, or rather a system which is able to correlate in real time different events coming in from different places and happening at different times, sometimes, if not often, all within a certain long or short time window of each other. And on top of that, a way to embed or interact with custom code to implement, let's say, some external logic additional for the decision making. And the answer, the missing piece is this, SEC, or other simple event correlator, a Perl 5 software. So, some small information. It's a software which has been around since the early 2000s. It's written in Perl 5 by a single developer, which is this guy from Estonia, which is not far from here, I guess, I gather. So, how does it work? Basically, it's a daemon which read logs line from one or multiple file sources. Then those lines go through rules, which attempt to match patterns, which are usually substring or regex with captures or even per subroutines, to those lines. And if matched, trigger actions. So what about the correlation part? OK, through rules, you can achieve correlation, which usually means detecting patterns and grouping together either single or multiple instances of the same event or single or multiple instances of distinct events that can happen more than a certain number of times within a certain time window. And when that happens, you can trigger actions as a consequence. Actions are usually of two different kinds, external or rather interaction with the system, so execution of system commands, sending data over the network, writing to files, etc., or some sort of internal operation. One is the generation of synthetic events, or rather events which you can generate starting from actual input events and then can go through themselves through the whole rule uh, engine and then cascade through other events or other actions, etc., and so forth. Or, for instance, you can get Perl subroutine calls or revals, which can actually allow you to write your own custom Perl code, which you can instantiate a startup, for instance, and then use that to gather information from outside. As I said, for instance, to geolocalize some EP you can find in your data. And then you've got context manipulation. What, is, what are context? Context are memory objects, which are implemented as sort of stacks which you can use to actually store data about events, which you can collect as, as, um, as you go along reading files, reading logs from data. Those contexts have uh, an adjustable lifetime, so when they expire, you can actually do something and trigger additional actions, and they can be accessed by your rules until they expire. So, um, as a conclusion, uh, this software allows for a powerful system to actually implement as a framework, real-time log correlation, and perform reactions immediately in, in near real-time to using external per code to augment its potential. This is a real-time situation. We actually use that to find anomalous behavior on distributed email systems from scammers in sending spams. And we actually um, use the rules um, in complemented by an external Perl code to actually geolocalize uh, those accesses and triggering remediation across remote systems. 
I finish. This is the website and the repos for the software. If you have additional questions, you can find me later. Thank you. here tomorrow and will want to play tourist. Who wants to be a tourist alone when you could be a tourist with others? So when Andrew finishes his closing and before we take off to the boat or wherever else you're going, just come up to the front of the room. We'll figure out who's here and what we might do together. And really, we need more ads today. Don't make it like the first day again. Uh, hello, I'm Choroba, I'm from Prague, and, wa and I work for Good Data. Uh, here are some uh, contact, uh, there's some contact information. Uh, I'll make the slides online uh, later. So uh, I'm going to talk about something called RGV or data, which is a small uh, module on CPAN and uh, I'll start with some examples so uh, if any one of you uh, uh, has ever participated in in a competition or those uh, problem-solving uh, sites they usually look pretty similar to each other uh, in this way you have uh, the problem defined at the beginning and then you have the sample input data here. And it's similar here. Again, there is the sample data set. The same thing happened in advent of code. Again, there is the sample input and this is Google Code Jam. They kind of mix input and, un and output, but it's a table, so if you just select this, it works. Uh, what I usually do when I participate in these things is I open a new file, which is populated by a boilerplate code like this, and I start uh, adding the input data into a data uh, part of the file so I can easily run it several times and fix bugs. So I'll start with something like this. I'm solving the uh, Rosalind bioinformatic uh, task that I showed before. So I'll start with something like this. Uh, hecky, hecky, hecky. And then I have something that looks like a solution. Uh, it works for the sample input. So I download the like large data set, try to run it, but oops, it gives this, the same output as it gave for the training data because, you know, I'm reading from the data section. So I have to remove the data from there and it starts working again, but the answer gets rejected because I still have a small bug somewhere, so I have to fix it and then I need to like get back to the training data to make sure I didn't break it and it doesn't work. So what I discovered was I put this line of code at the beginning which kind of it uses 
data if there is no input and no parameter. But I always fo forgot how to write it precisely because there is the negation and unless and something. So uh, in the end, there is a module for that. And if, if you use it, it will, the diamond operator will read from the input if it exists. And if it doesn't exist, it will read from the data section. Uh, it's on CPEN, it's in GitHub. Thank you, that's all. Hello, uh, I'm Alex Daniel, and I'm still a release manager for Rakuda Pro 6. So in the Rakuda Pro 6, we have a couple of really cool tools, and one of which is bisectable, and all of the developers really love this, so I thought, why not talk about it? So the problem it attempts to solve is something like this. So let's say you have a ticket, which uh, comes with this snippet, and as it turns out, uh, previously we had something sensible as the, uh, as the output if you get, put this into a file. So basically it says that, hey, you have a redeclaration of i. Okay, fine, but the problem is that now we have something like this. And so the question is, when did this change? So a lot of you will probably say that, well, why not use git bisect, right? Yeah, and it makes sense, and Git will basically jump between the re uh, between the revisions, basically doing the binary search. And yeah, that works, but Rakudo build time is actually a bit less than three minutes currently. So yeah, you'll have to wait for three minutes, then you have to test stuff, then you have to wait for three minutes again. So nobody should really spend time doing that. So instead, you can use git bisect run, of course, and you pass the shell script to it, and then it will do everything automatically. And that's nice, but in Rakuda we actually have over 9,000 commits since the Christmas release. So that's roughly 13 steps. And as, as you can guess, three minutes by 13 is just too long. So in 2016, I wondered if anybody thought about building Rakuda for every single commit in the Git history. And long story short, I implemented it, uh, implemented it and uh, three days later, the bot joined the RSC channel. And today it works like this. So you just give it a piece of code that we saw earlier, and it figure out, figures out by itself uh, which uh, bisection strategy it should use. So in this case, it looks, okay, you have the, the exit code is different, so we'll use that, and 10 seconds later, you get the result, and as well as the bisect lock in case you actually want to see that. So back when this was implemented, the reaction on the RC channel was like this, right? <laughs> And a bit later, we started to realize that it actually affects the way we actually do the development of uh, Rakuda itself. Because uh, given the pace of Rakuda development today and the fact that we always get like new optimizations, this really helps us to, to make sure that the regressions are not appearing in actual releases. But that's not enough because uh, we have the ecosystem and it, bisecting modules can be a bit difficult sometimes, so we actually implemented a tool that tests every module in the ecosystem. And the tools that figures out which modules are now broken is called Blin. And Blin will automatically bisect the Rakuda for modules that are affected, and the output looks like this. So you have a list of modules, and for every module you get the Rakuda commit that actually introduced the, the regression. And you, as a bonus, you actually get the uh, the uh, dependency graph in case you want to look at that. And so if you are still thinking that if you have a like large project that is actively maintained and you still have excuses for not implementing something like this, so there's a slide for you, but for everyone else, thank you for your time and thanks for listening.
Uh, why you think was this guy upgraded to a suite? No, actually, my friend over there was the bastard. But in I don't know if anyone noticed, but in uh, the pearl sigil room or the the percent, sorry, the clock was actually a pearl brand clock, a slightly misspelled, but still, I mean, it makes sense. It's a wall clock, uh, so you know, good, great uh, on you, Radisson. Thanks for the accommodation. I'm not, I haven't started. Uh-huh. Because I don't know how to get HDMI sound. Well, if it's just sound. Anyway, who needs sound when you're recording something? Hi, I'm Julian. Um, Lee spoke about the kits that we put together um, for the conferences to video things, and they're using them right now. Um, but they're pretty big, and we're going to look at that. Uh, at the Munich Power Workshop that year, uh, this year, we didn't have a second camera, but we had two rooms. So we had to come up with a solution. This is uh, one of the kits. When I had it in London, um, this is a pretty big and pretty heavy box. They're not fun to carry around. Um, this is what it looked like in Munich, set up in the main room, and Lee is there doing something. Um, you get the camera, you get the big computer. They've replaced some of them with laptops now, I believe. Uh, well, not every event has these. Now, there are ways to get them. We, they can be shipped, but you don't always have them. Um, and as I said, the box is really heavy. I, I, at least, usually carry a lot of phone stuff with me. Let's look at the things I carry around with me. That's all in my backpack all the time. Um, so there are power banks. I'm not sponsored by Anchor. I just think they make good products. Um, so you should uh, maybe get some. Um, there are lots of cables, typically USB-C and micro-USB. There is a uh, spare phone I always have on me in case I drop the other one or it gets stolen again. Um, yeah, and, they've, and they've got Bluetooth headsets, uh, or one anyway. So, uh, but there's something else, this thing. Now, what is that? Uh, it is called a fin, not this fin. Where's the fin? There is a fin here somewhere. Oh. No, not that Finn. I meant the other, the shadow cat Finn. Oh, he's upstairs. Uh, he's packing the camera. See? Uh, so this thing is a is a bike mount for smartphones that is really useful if you want to just um, get a rental bike somewhere in the city, for example, to play Ingress. But we can use it for something else, um, and we'll look at that. But um, yeah, if we want to use our phone to record a talk, the microphone in the phone is really bad. Um, so you will get what's around the phone, but not the speaker up front here. But we can remedy that um, if we use the Bluetooth headset. That's why I'm wearing this headset, and most of you might not have noticed I'm wearing it, which is the point. So uh, there's still the problem that the camera app on the phone doesn't know how to deal with Bluetooth as the input. Oh, uh, well, we can remedy that. Um, there are apps that can camera apps that can actually do this, like this one, Cinema FV5 Lite. Unfortunately, it can only um, record 720p. Uh, so for full HD, you have to buy it. We didn't at the time because there was no payment data on my phone, on the spare phone. Oh, it's gone. Anyway, this is what it looks like when it's set up. Uh, specifically, it's this bit. It's tiny. It's easy to, uh, easy to set up. There's a power bank on it. And if you can stick a memory card in, it actually works quite well. And the good thing is it's not in the way for the people watching the talk. Let's do a live demo. First step of the live demo, and I know they always fail, but we'll see if there's sound. So this is Theo giving a talk using this. Uh, oh, do? Okay, it comes from here. I don't know how to get it in there, Shima. has a nice thing that's called test exception. Well, it's a separate module, but it is included. And test exception, what does it for you? Well, you have a... Well, you, you get the point. It's actually quite good quality, but let's try another live demo. Um, so I have actually recorded my talk just now with this. And I'm now carrying this to the front, and I don't know where I'm going to put it. I'll just hold it the whole time. Uh, 
I will upload the thing. Oh yeah, excellent. Now finally he's useful. <laughs> so it's it's here. <laughs> Let me just uh, let's do a, like a camera sweep. Okay, this is working. There are people. Nice. Unfortunately, the phone is upside down. So before I will upload this to YouTube and post the link in the channel, I have to flip it. Um, there, there's going to be a five-minute video in the Telegram channel later. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, first I just wanted to show you something really quick. I got an email yesterday. There is this uh, 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 here obfuscated piece of code, and uh, this guy, David Flink, he emailed me that he ported this to WebPerl. So um, yeah, just wanted to show off one of the cool things you can do with WebPerl, because uh, I constantly get asked, uh, what am I using it in production and so on, and I don't really have a good answer. So. This is my actual talk, watching trees drink uh, with WebPro. Um, so what are we doing? We're measuring what's called sap flow. And sap flow is basically uh, how much water is flowing up and down the tree trunk. And um, why do we measure it? Because it's important for the water cycle. Uh, if we know how much rain falls, we want to know how much goes into the groundwater, how much goes into the plants, how much just evaporates, and so on. Uh, so how do we measure it? We have these sensors that go in the sapwood of the tree, that's the part of the tree that measures, uh, sorry, that carries the water. And uh, we drill two tiny holes in it that don't really hurt the tree, and uh, we insert two little rods in it. Uh, one of the, both of them measure temperature, um, and they actually measure the temperature difference between the, these two rods, and uh, one of them is heated. And so if the water is flowing quickly, then these two will be at a similar temperature. If the water is flowing slowly, then the temperature difference between them will rise. It's a pretty simple idea, and it uh, works pretty well. Then you do some calculations based on how big the tree is, and um, you can figure out approximately how much water the tree is taking up at which point in time. Now, <clears throat> in we gathered the data into a data logger. We download it once in a while, and uh, now we wanted to look at it. I actually got an email on Tuesday uh, from one of our PhDs. Uh, she asked me, hey, can you plot this data for me? And so this is an actual thing that I've wanted to do for a while. And so because people have been bugging me so much uh, to show an actual production use, I hacked this together really quick. So we are actually going to use this. So. Um, this is the interface, and the nice thing about this is I'm pulling together a whole bunch of different uh, JavaScript APIs. So the first thing is this thing called Golden Layout, which provides these nice little this nice little tabbed interface. You can rearrange it however you like. Uh, so that's kind of neat. Um, then it provides this nice plotting library here. Uh, not golden layout, that's sorry, that's plotly.js. That's a not really nice JavaScript plotting library. Uh, I also pulled in a CSV parser called Papa Pars. Um, and, uh, you know, you can build WebPro with text CSV, but I didn't have the time to do that. So I'm using a JavaScript parser. So if I select one of our data files here, I load it in here, I get this really nice plot. And you can, uh, you know, because the JavaScript library provides all these nice functions, you can zoom, you can scroll over it and see. So here, for example, we have uh, daily cycles that we see. So this is at 12 o'clock noon, where you see the temperature difference is relatively low. And uh, here at, well, midnight or so, the temperature difference gets high, which means at that point in time, it is transporting less water. And during the day, it's transporting more water. And we can estimate approximately how much. This is two trees. Um, the blue and yellow are one tree. The green and red are another tree. And yeah, so you know, this is a nice thing. You can play with your data here. You can uh, download it as a PNG. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, it's, it's, you get a lot of stuff for free just by including these existing libraries. So what does this whole thing look like in the code? It looks something like this. I have an HTML file where I um, 
basically just pull all the components together, a couple of style sheets, some of my own style, um, and then I pull in all the JavaScript libraries, Plotly, the plotting library, pop up pars, the CSV parser, I pull in jQuery, I pull in golden layout, uh, web Perl, of course, and then I pull in my Perl script here, script type text Perl, plot GUI.pl. Now let's look at that. Oops. So at the top, I start use web Perl. I get the jQuery object, so I can operate with that. I set up my golden layout, so the tabbed layout. Um, this is all operating on the JavaScript objects. I set that up. I set up my plot here. This is just the styling, you know, what x-axis, y-axis, and so on. Set it up with some initial data. Now I have the Perl code that to actually munge the data and um, to put it in the plot. So, you know, rearrange the CSV file, give it uh, decent column names, and so on. And then I have the file upload feature where I, um, you know, where you can select a file, upload it into here, and have it parsed by JavaScript. And that makes this a really nice interface with just a little bit of code by pulling together libraries, and it's all stitched together using Perl. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, hi, you know, I, I've told you before that Perceptrix is hiring, and of course we're hiring, but I'm not here to talk to you about that today. I've just been thinking that at Perceptrix we use a lot of Perl 5, but I would really like to be using Perl 6, and how interesting that is, and because Perl 6, it has all this reactive programming, object-oriented functional programming, and we've called it whatever-oriented programming. And so the idea just hit me, you know, this is my modest proposal, is we should rename uh, Perl 6 to whatever. And if we call it whatever, then, uh, you know, then I can go to my boss and go, well, what should I use for this? And he goes, well, just use whatever. And I'm like, and then I'm like, great, I can start using all these Chrome microservices and everything. And, you know, okay, maybe it'll be hard to Google for the language, but whatever. Um, so, yeah, what, what, you know, whatever works. Just do whatever works. And, uh, if you want to know what the uh, greatest language in the world is, like, whatever. <laughs> Any more adverts? This is the first time I've had VGA fail this way. <laughs> All right, while we're waiting here, um, the last talk uh, was um, on basic Perl 6. And one of the questions at the very end was how the range operator from you know, 1 dot dot 1 comma 2 comma 3, 1 comma 2 comma 4 comma 8 comma 16, that's great, but can I do things like the triangle operator? Well, i.e. 1, 2, i.e. 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 36, etc. Um, well, while I was waiting here, I wrote that, but I don't have my laptop here. I have it right here on my phone. And while we're waiting here, And with one second here, uh, I'm sure Jeff can tell us that all the tests ran. Yep. So all done here on palm of your hand in Perl 6. Thank you. Cheers. I'm again. Um, what is an object? Yeah. Of course you know. Yeah. Uh, it started all many, many years ago when I did my own Perl 6 documentation, 2005 or 6. Uh, I read Damien's object-oriented Perl, and there was a quite interesting line as, at the start of the book. Object orient uh, about object orientation. I quoted only roughly uh, because I don't have the book yet on my laptop, and then. There are several different definitions of, of what object orientation is, and none of them agree with each other. So, what what are really objects? 
we already heard that, glorified structs. And every boring introduction tells you it's data with functionality, yada, yada, yada. Some people say, so we can have inheritance, but um, there are enough papers that uh, inheritance is not good. Uh, there are people who say even multiple inheritance is a sin so deadly it can be only forgiven once in a life. <laughs> and if even Bjorn Solstrup, who introduced into C++ a multiple inheritance, gives on the European Conference of Object-Oriented Programming in Prague, 2015, the talk Object Orientation Programming Without Inheritance, you know it's not popular anymore. Um, polymorphism, almost same thing, and you cannot have it without objects, so mm, it can't be. Some would say um, it's for decoupling, some even smarter people say it's about messaging. Mm. And when I asked uh, Jonathan about he told me, yeah, actually I heard uh, it was more about late binding. And if um, Larry once said, uh, yeah, in Perl 6, our object system for the types and stuff, so everything is in its place. It's just for ordering stuff. So what is it really? Just ask, ask uh, the guy who coined the term. He did a lot of important stuff, but you, you all know that already. Um, he was, in an answer mail he said uh, in 2003, I mean you can read for yourself, so he mentions messaging um, of hiding a state and late binding. So of course Jen Jonathan was right and um, let's formulate that a little bit easier. I would say it's like independent cells because I think uh, the biologic metaphor um, gives us good service here. So it's like um, we are built, or our bodies are built of cells, and they have data in their core, DNA. They communicate with each other, uh, either their methods, other chemicals or molecules, uh, and um, uh, they are in most, um, their ordering is the most efficient way to um, for the given task and uh, this tells you why uh, uh, MVOC is an anti-pattern because we have all the logic all the data in one place and a lot of uh, communication and that's the opposite of what I meant I meant really independent cells who have the amount of data they need um, so you can have the communication between uh, uh, low yeah, if you want to have a nice talk on YouTube, uh, one explain that he's a little ranty, but I think the talk in itself is good. Um, and uh, that's why it's also a design pattern bullshit, uh, or mostly, uh, not only because... Oh, oh, it's getting hot. Uh, because, of course, they use inheritance, um, they even use classes when they sh should use interfaces, and it's um, overly complicated. I remember... Um, I once um, mm, um, that, uh, for instance, they have big stuff about uh, iterable when we just have a nice for loop in Perl 5, which is much easier in Perl 6. Also, iterable is an interface, how it should be. Uh, role, yeah. Um, just um, to hurry, um, there are even a big movement uh, against. Um, OOP, I wouldn't go so far. You have to uh, know um, how to do it. Um, do, uh, finding the right architecture is hard and um, that would be a um, talk of its own. But um, I think a, a modern way uh, would be um, follow the function. There are guys who made the Chrome uh, browser, which isn't the slowest uh, software on earth, six times as fast. They rewritten it, followed a function, made less uh, much less ob objects um, and it's also very fascinating um, talk I will give it in a slide later I didn't found it so um, I would call them not objects I would call them subjects because they have life on their own of course we wouldn't call it subject oriented uh, programming so I don't want to call you SOB or like, subject oriented programmers or such 
but um, if it's a nice metaphor, uh, so uh, to see that uh, every like every cell that is alive on its own will on its own, and I think it that leads to a much better design. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sasper. Uh, last year at the London Power Workshop, I announced a new <laughs> web service called Sipan Grunga, which is a uh, Sipan source code searching engine service. Uh, the main feature of it is it supports, it allows you to grab not only Power 5 modules, but also Power 6 modules. So if you have, if you're looking for something, Interesting, then visit grab.sipanauthors.org. Enjoy. And by the way, uh, Sipan services like this needs to pass distribution name for grouping. And usually it's easy because Sipan modules are, Sipan distribution are fairly well organized. And Sipan this name info has been the def de facto standard mod Power 5 modules for that purpose. However, it is not maintained for years, though it has a few issues, and it is not unmaintained. Uh, it is not maintained by the two chain gang too. So it's so I've been using a patched version of, for Sipans, but I didn't want to repeat that for Sipan Grunga, so I was going to pin the gang, but I thought twice. Let's test it with backspan first. Then I did it, and I found something. For example, sip and this name info says this. <laughs> this quite often, <laughs> this kind of distribution are found quite often when you first start using this data. And sip and this name info says that name of this distribution is V. Or Sip and this, this name info says the name of this DBI class, DBIX class in inflate clam S3 is DBIX class in inflate clam. And its version is S3. Of course not. And a few more examples. Uh, uh, Sip and this name info says the name of this distribution is XM, XM. XMS motif set V, but of course not. Or config in reader encrypted two is config in reader and its version is encrypted too. No. Or font F2, FT2. So why this happens? Because Sip and this name info looks for distribution name and version at the same time using uh, Logix, but it might be better to look for a version first and then treat the rest uh, as a name. So I wrote a module called pass this name as a proof of concept instead of apply, applying a breaking change to the existing code. So let's see. Now, uh, v all the ten distributions name is empty and version is v all ten dot ten and dbx dbx class inflate clam s3 name dbx class inflate clam s3 and version is null and same 
da, da. <laughs> so this module fixed uh, uh, more than 200 cases. However, out of 300,000 backbound distributions, so it's kind of trivial. And most of most cases are ancient or accidental or often removed already. So I'm not sure it's really import, useful, important, but at least at least every issue found is listed in, in this test. So if you are interested, look at it. However, it is not, it, it, may, it may not be perfect yet. This morning I found this case and it looks, it looks better, but actually it was. So I released a new version this morning. And I, I have started this module for CPANS and CPANGURUNGA and if everything goes well, I might be trying to ask Andreas or uh, other pe people to use this. And if you want to use this, uh, there are two caveats, so be careful. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, hey, Matt, could you bring over the... Ah, there we go. Yes, 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 yes. So one thing that I, I wanted to, as a small announcement, so um, how many people here organized the conference before? Wow, that's, that's actually impressive. I'm sorry. Um, it is very hard work. It is very, very, very hard work. And uh, one thing that we haven't done yet is say thank you for our organizers. And they deserve a thank you. Uh, today I want to show a little tool I did two weeks ago. As every good tool, I did it in two days because we need it. And, well, I already talked about our architecture and we have a bunch of workers. And we try to log everything to syslog. So that means that we have a bunch of logs, like many, many logs. And we group all together in well, not in one CISL, in, in one journal D, but in groups of journal Ds. And sometimes we can't reproduce problems in developers' machines, so we need to go and check these logs. And this is how we used to do it. It's, okay, we have to grab through the logs and try to figure out how this works. Sorry. Uh, so, two weeks ago we were hunt, hunting for a problem and we, well, we were doing, going on and, uh, on and off with the problem for a couple of days and finally we, we, we find the problem and we couldn't fix the problem quite fast so we had to do some tricks so we decided that probably we can use our bot to fix the problem with when it appears, because it was a temporal problem. So, but we needed to give access to the bot, to the, to the logs, right? So how, how do you uh, give the, the bot uh, access, right? So, well, we were thinking, and as we are quite fan of Mosho, I, well, uh, WebSocket was a, like the solution, right? So I wrote right in, in, in a couple hours, a, well, a probably less than that, a really small solution to expose the logs on a WebSocket. And it looked like something like that, right? Where you just open and the string of logs and, well, you string to the to WebSocket. And it's this, just this amount of code, it's, it's not too much. And well, it did work, like first test was okay, so we did some tests also with Mosho and it, it was 
streaming logs, so we decided to deploy and uh, implement a plugin for our bot so we can make the bot to do some stuff when some logs appear. So we de deployed that also and we went to sleep and the next morning we arrived at the office and the problem was happened again and the bot did nothing. <laughs> so yeah, you know that situation, right? So we start looking <laughs> and finally after a couple hours looking we detected that the problem wasn't our code. The problem was, of course, Shift-ND, you know? <laughs> of course. I don't know why, if someone knows why, I really want to know. But if you try to use this in, Sys in, in Syslog, in journal D, at some point, it stopped. I don't know why. And we reproduced it several times in our boxes and also in the servers. It's really easy to reproduce, so good. So well, we throw a couple more lines of Perl to the problem, so we define a timeout, which is much, much uh, smaller in, in a real life situation. I think if we don't get a log in one second, we restart. Uh, and we restart, and well, then we have to monitor if the, if the log is giving logs and well, and if not, we will start it again and well, and this works. So it was fixed kind of because I had to fix also some memory leaks and stuff and some file handler leaks, but well, it, it worked. So with this, we solved our, pro our problem, and it was working. And then I was at home at the sofa and watching. Well, I wasn't, but my daughter was watching a movie, and she got asleep. And I decided, what if I add an interface to it? So well, I add a root to the application. And then I, in the same file of the Motion Issues Lite uh, application, I wrote some, like, hundred lines of JavaScript and then I decide I can also filter and I have not much time so I go to the demo so this is what I got so this is the log from my box as I have no many logs I cannot show so I did a little script with the help of CPAN I can make some noise on my logs so the, the nice thing of it, this is the logs of the application. So I can filter, and when I filter, let's say 20, okay, or let's say uh, Dalek. <laughs> How it works is it will use the same WebSocket to send to the server the filter, and it will be compiled as a regular expression so the server will only send to the application the logs that match the regular expression. And it works quite, quite good. And we are also using this to debug this, this thing. So if you like it, I, today, as I was going to give this lightning talk, I released it on, on GitHub. And please use it, break it. And if you break it, please send me patches. Thank you. Uh, during our nice conference in Riga are right now also two other conferences on parsing. Um, if you're interested, there will be also videos on the internet uh, to watching that. Um, I, when you go on my lightning talk uh, in the schedule, there I inserted the link to the um, conferences page of uh, some organizers and there you have all the details of it. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Stefan, and I am a myth maker. So you think usually it's the other guys, but here I am, and I want to apologize to other communities. So do you know that I uh, admire a lot of hustle guys 
or Haskell. So they show me extremely strong languages. Uh, I always think good of um, Audrey who inspired me, but anyway, I just can't think the, their way. I just can't read their code and I basically gave up. So the question is, um, would it help if they rename their language? And uh, I don't think, I think they can live well without me. So there's another language and I really apologize because here it's a more serious case because I really, yeah, to me the code looks all the same. And I really seriously tried multiple times and they also have a difficult history. So they, I always, when I tried to end it in this, oh yeah, yeah, someone told me this, it was a two seven way and use the version free and it's, yeah, there will be a future when it doesn't matter anymore. And I also can't stand there, ah, oh, there's only one true way and oh yeah, but it's fine. I just walk along. So the question is, would it help if they rename their language? And I don't think so. It's me. So yeah, in Lisp, <laughs> it's parents everywhere. So, and by the way, was it Lisp or was it Scheme or was it, oh yeah, I'm in Emacs. Uh, or was it Common Lisp player in Emacs Lisp and, or, or whatever. And this true thing, was it true or was it the hash true? Or oh man, oh man. And I love the Emacs and but I'm not good enough, so I really fail. But what did help me? It was... Uh, <laughs> yay! <laughs> I just plug it <laughs> So at least this time we can say it failed for the sa in the same way, right? Maybe it's a lightning talk and we apply lightning. That might work. Um, See if it works. No, nearly, but not quite. Uh, wait a second. No. Wait a second. We interrupt your regularly scheduled lightning talk with an advertisement. <laughs> For speakers, lightning or otherwise, remember in the website where you're able to enter all your details, there's room for three URLs. Somebody just mentioned he put something in for one. For those of you who haven't done it yet, don't forget to do it. You have slides hiding somewhere. We now return you to your regularly scheduled lightning talk. So yeah, I love this Emacs thing. And what I did is I went out to Lisp hackers and they didn't care for my name. They didn't care for their language name. They just helped me. So I think if they had renamed their language, I would still be lost in Emacs. So it's fine. So what I do love, and I still have a minute in my lightning talk is I love Perl. I'm a Perl mongers. I organized Perl conferences. I am at a Perl conference and on the left side you see Perl and on the right side you see this fluffy plush mascot which I also love and I love both the way they are and I can clearly separate them and I love them the way they are. Thank you very much. You've got to love hardware. <laughs> right, so we had our I think he turned the mic off. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, hardware. Any more adverts? Thank you, sponsors. Yes, thank you very much to all the sponsors. <laughs> cPanel, booking.com, 
uh, there's a lot of you to list and I cannot remember you all. There's a poster. Eligo, Edument, Critica, Pearl Services, Geek Uni, Open Suze, OP, uh, Pearl Six, the uh, Pearl Foundation, EPO, Shadowcat Systems, Yapsi Europe Foundation, Validad, Perceptics, One Two Three Reg, Meta Cpan. What's the one next to it? I can't read it from here. Pearl Shop, the Pearl Shop, the one. What's the one to the left? Pearl Maven, Looney Labs, and Black Stories. Thank you. Pardon. And the big, t I already mentioned at the beginning, but C-Panel and Booking again. <laughs> Thank you for all of you. Without you, we would not have been able to do this conference. Thank you very much. Hi. This should be a lightning talk about the uh, Pearl community, as we are here and all over the world. And what, well, as an outsider, CTPF can do to improve. Um, I am talking that about that because over the last year I heard a lot of those rumors about the COC and we have people are too loud in the community and uh, I don't know how to say, uh, bug other people and make them to want to resign and I also see that um, the TPF should have some conference patronage and deal with a COC violation better, maybe, don't know. And yeah, that's all rumors a bit in the last year. And I understand when the TPF says, oh, we don't want to have it public. But too private doesn't help anyone because no one knows after it. Then we have the word of mouth and hearsay and well, I think all members of the Pearl community deserve a little bit more clear words on some decisions. So I think the TPF should open up themselves a little bit and let Pearl contributors participate. Everyone who uploaded a reasonable amount of Perl modules or contributions to Perl 5 core, NQP, more VM, Perl 6, or gave several talks and maybe blame himself with that, but I don't know, um, should be kind of be able to participate. So TPF should probably invite those people to do. It's strongly advised in such a situation that those who are currently in TPF member, uh, mentor those new invites to avoid chaos happen there and allow to grow the new members and so on. It's well proved in other US foundations I know and where I'm a member. They have, for example, annual board of directors election from all members from the community they have invited before. And important decisions are discussed in a private channel of the organization. So it's not public, but any member of the com community can contribute, can participate, but doesn't have to. And all decisions which are made can be reviewed later to learn from them and behave correctly. Thank you. Hello. Um, I would like, uh, basically, I was checking the feedback regarding the naming uh, discussion uh, during the day, and most of the feedback we got so far is generally very civil, very mature, and in general just appropriate. So it's very nice to be part of this nice community, and I would like to everyone to give a round of applause just for ourselves and for the community. So, uh, hello, before the proper lightning talk starts, two self-adverts, advert, one for the Pearlcon wiki, so you know 
we are trying to get more people involved in the organization of the Pearl Conferences. So we have this wiki where we figure out what we want to do. So maybe you want to read it, join it, and amend it. And also there's this venue mailing list, which was used to be run by the venue, uh, by the Pearl uh, Yaps Euro Foundation. Uh, it's open by now, so you, if you want to you know, be involved in organizing conferences and stuff, subscribe in here, participate in the discussion. So, but now to my regularly scheduled lightning talk. <laughs> Uh, so yesterday it was suggested we should, you know, redo all lightning talks. So th I gave this one in 2008 in, at the Dutch Pearl Workshop in, in Arnhem. This is a slightly improved version about something called ACME return value. Uh, so yeah, have you seen this error maybe? Uh, some module did not return a true value. You get it when you forget to add a true value as the last statement of your Perl 5 package. I guess Perl 6 has improved this. I don't know. So you add this one at the end and then everything works. So, but returning one, of course, is so boring. Uh, a lot of things are true statements, like 42. Or not, not 42. Still a true statement. Or well, false, also a true statement. Um, so, and of course, you can also end your packages with stuff like that. That's fun. And I was, so I was asking myself back then, uh, so, what kind of interesting return values are actually out there? Um, so I wrote, wrote Acme return value, which is a, it's using PPI, which is a Perl parser written in Perl. So yes, that's possible. Back then it was like a new thing. Now a lot of tools use it. Uh, it's a little bit slow, but yeah, it works. Um, so now I'm forwarding to now. So this has changed for this lightning talk. Uh, so yesterday I finally ran this script again over the whole of CPAN. So I downloaded the mini CPAN on my laptop. I started it uh, after the lightning talks yesterday. It finished sometimes during the uh, tennis dinner. Uh, and what was nice, so the code just worked after collecting dust since my last change in 2013. So thanks a lot to P5P for keeping Perl stable while still adding nice new features. <laughs> and yeah, you can view the results over there. Uh, or we can do a live demo, or we can do a live demo because I'm not that crazy. Um, so this is the web page that's generated from these results. Um, you have some cool values and some cool distributions. If you take a look at the cool return values, you see like uh, the count of some of the return values and how, how many they use. I guess the first one is a bug. I'm not sure. Yeah, but so you see people are using a lot of stuff. You have political statements. Um, <laughs> Uh, whatever, you have a lot of true value, guesses, false, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so that's, that's like a big list of stuff you can go through. Then you can show all of the packages that use 42 as a return value, for example. They are now linked to search, uh, oh, I didn't update it here. They should be linked to uh, metacpan.org. I have to update that. Uh, there's also a list of cool distributions where you can have the same information, just split up per uh, distribution. Um, yeah, it's just some nice and crazy stuff. Uh, you have <laughs> something like that. So you can, you know, <laughs> continue that thing. Um, yeah, yeah, browse through it, have some fun. Uh, maybe add some fun return values to your modules or don't, I don't care. Um, but so what I really think this thing shows is that the Perl community is a little bit crazy and a little bit fun and, and cool and, and nice and not so you know, boring, uh, which is why I you know, love this community and really like participating in it. And so yeah, keep the crazy going and see you next year. Thank you. It's not broken. So uh, how many of us should put um, high ACME return value at the end of our modules? <laughs> so that's the end of the lightning talks, part three. Oh. Remember, today's lightning speaker is tomorrow's keynoter, and your first hit is free. You've seen them done now. We expect one out of you next year here. Or a pro, or a pro workshop closer to home. And now it is time to finish. <laughs>